This is One on One. Welcome to One on One. Uh, my friend Tim McLuhan just stuck his head in the shot, but you'll see him right now. You recognize him. There he is. Tim McLuhan is the owner of McLuhan's Restaurants, but he is so much more than that. You are so much more. Uh, Incredible amount of debt, yes. I am you have debt, really. but you have more than that. Hey, quick, uh, could you tell folks uh, what Holiday Express is and why that's so great? And then we'll talk about 10 other things you're doing. Well, it's something we started back in. Uh, it was one of those inadvertent from your kitchen table deals. Uh, I was working for the New Jersey Nets at the time. Uh, and the announcing you know, their the games Nets, and doing you. promotion and stuff. And one of the owners came up, and one of the players uh, came up with the idea of doing something for the homeless in Newark on Christmas Eve. So I went, and it was 1991, and it was a great idea, and it really felt good. And, you know, driving back down the parkway, I lived down the Jersey Shore, which proves I didn't grow up in the Jersey Shore, because I say down the shore. <laughs> but uh, I'm driving down, and I'm playing, you know, Christmas songs on the radio in my car and feeling kind of good about stuff, but there was no music at the show. So I went back again, and all we talked about, every once in a while, we said, hey, we're going to do that thing again on Christmas Eve. So we went back in 92, and because I'm a genius, I brought a boombox with, like, <laughs> Johnny Mathis stuff, you know. And there's these 500 people who are, you know, really marginalized in society, and that's another whole story altogether. But um, so it was a great experience again. So it just kept bugging me. And some of my friends said, will you stop talking about this and just do it? So what we did was we started a thing. It was really just going to be about music in the beginning. So I put together a band of people that I'd played music with over the years, and there were 17 of them showed up. They really liked it. And uh, so I said, well, if we're going to go to the trouble of learning all these songs, do you want to do more than one event? So they said, sure. So we did 10 that first year. And we'd go to places that basically, if we're not there, they get little or no attention at holiday time. But it became much more Name than a band. Well, we go to all the, we go to Soup Kitchen, St. John's Soup Kitchen in Newark, in Newark. is where we, that's where I started, and we end up there still every year on Christmas Eve. But we do two other places, St. Anne's is also in Newark, we do it at the same time, and then down the shore, it's Trinity. So we're actually at three soup kitchens at the same moment on Christmas Eve. Mm. But we, this year we did 63 events, uh, mostly in New Jersey, and we go to all the residential long-term psychiatric facilities. What we mostly do is play to adult orphans. Why do you do this? It feels so damn good. It's the truth. I grew up, I, I think, and a lot of people have asked me that, and I did grow up at the Veterans Hospital in East Orange. My dad was in charge of entertainment and sports and stuff for the returning vets. And it was a very impactful place because when I was living there, they were coming off of World War II to some extent, but a lot of Korean vets. And I saw horrible stuff. Um, you know, amputees, people with what they would refer now as restless leg syndrome. That's the one that used to scare me the most mm -hmm. when I was a little boy. And it really impacted me, and I got to know a lot of the soldiers through my dad's job. And uh, I think it just stuck with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always told people, and you probably have said the same thing, if you think I'm anything good, you should have met my father, you know, yeah, right. Joe McClune. And uh, so it was always lurking in me, and, and then it just steamrolled. You know, yeah. to some extent, I feel like Forrest Gump, you know, that on that scene when he's out on the road and he looks back and he sees all these people following him. It's like, they why are you following me? me? We have about... 500 people on Holiday Express now. We've got over 100 volunteer musicians. And all we do is we just bring the biggest holiday party you could possibly imagine with all the costume characters and Santa. We're not selling religion or anything else. We're just trying to give a really great time for two and a half, three hours to people who get little or nothing the entire year. The other part of that is you're a successful businessman, you know? Let's Tough. put that word successful in quotes, but I'll, yeah, I'll right, go with it. <laughs> My favorite McClunes. Uh, is up in West Orange, New Jersey, right? Yeah. That's my place. Well, that's our most recent. We've been there a couple of years now. Describe uh, the whole McLoon's um, empire. <laughs> you well, like we, that? <laughs> we, we have seven active places and one in the water in yeah. Seabright. We're, we're getting ready to rebuild that. Oh, geez. You know, it's an interesting thing because uh, we have a place down in National Harbor in Maryland. Most of them are on, yeah. uh, on the shore or up here in West Orange, as you said. And I don't mind plugging. We're going to be opening up in Hoboken in the no, spring. No, you don't mind plugging. I don't mind at all. I'm greedy, but it was really weird because uh, when we were talking to people from Maryland, they had visited us in Pure Village in Long Branch, and they had lunch at the place, I guess, and they really liked it, and so they got in touch with me and said, we want you to come down to Maryland and do one down there, and it's a Pure Village kind of place, except mm. like on steroids, it's like 10 times the size of Pure Village, and so I kept asking them, I said, why do you want me to come down from New Jersey? You know, I only had two places at the time, and they said, well, nobody down here has your concept. So I kind of let that go. What is the concept? Well, I kind of let that comment go, right? And so over the course of a couple of years of negotiating and stuff, it kept coming up about my concept. And we're out one evening, and I think we'd had a couple of adult beverages, and finally I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and they said, we're really happy you're bringing your concept to National Harbor. And I said, I have to ask you, 
what the heck's my concept? <laughs> you have to. And tell they looked me. at me like I was crazy. And I said, No, really, I don't know. What's my concept? And they said, Upscale dining for the whole family. And it's true. It is. We try not to be too fussy. We try not to be too expensive. But we are the place that if a parent has a 14-year-old and they really don't get along well going out to dinner at <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese or wherever, right. we're the middle ground for them. And, it, and it's funny because I'm a working musician, so down at our Pure Village place, I had actually never been there on a Saturday night since we opened for like two years. Right. Because I was working with my band. You're performing. You're on the was, road. I was in there one Saturday night, and I'm looking around. I like, oh, my God, look at all the kids. That's right. But the kids I was referring to were between the ages of, let's say, 9 and 16. And that's what was going on. And that's, I mean, we're not a kid's place, but... Um, I think that we've tried to do is develop a menu that no one feels intimidated out of us, even financially, that they can find something on our menu. If they mm. want to go out to dinner and they're on a low budget, they can find something. And by the same token, we have to establish a, a reputation, I guess, that if you want to come and have a fine dining experience, I can do that for you, too. Let me ask you this, because you've so, been so involved in charity work and philanthropy. We're close to the folks that make a wish. Yeah. You know those folks? Well, you know I do. Uh, we were one of those ironic circumstances, you know, it's going to be even difficult for me to talk to you about it now. Uh, I had done their annual dinner with my band and I emceed I it and you were working with them and this went on for about five years and we would do video presentations. Anyway, I, you know, it, it's weird for me that I if still struggle to, no, I don't mind it because it's good for make wish and it's good for the people that are fighting the good fight from the Valerie Fund and all that. Our son was diagnosed with leukemia after I've been doing the make a wish shows for about five years. And they got in touch with me right away and, and you know, it was kind of ironic. I think I've told you this before, but uh, they offered us a wish and I kept pushing them off. And I was like, oh, you know, I help you raise money. I don't want to take the money. Uh, we're fine, you know. And, and finally, after about three or four of those, they said, you don't get it, do you? And I said, what? They said, it's not your wish. It's your son's wish. So the next year at that dinner, we put up pictures of this young boy and I described him to everyone and what happened. I said, well, that's my son. And... Uh, it was, a, it was such a great life lesson for anybody, you know. Um, part of the difficulty for us was learning to accept help. Um, I did get used to doing things for other people, and, and it did, didn't make me a great person. It just made me a needy person in some ways. I needed to do things for others. And so uh, the story I've told a lot of times was that Jack was really deathly ill. Uh, he had leukemia, and there's a three-and-a-half-year protocol with those kids, not a three-and-a-half month. We thought we were going to... First of all, once we realized he wasn't going to die the next day because right. he was so ill. Um, but then we're thinking, okay, six months, a year, and they, they start talking about three and a half years. It was like a, a shock. Um, and he was really on the edge a bunch of times. But anyway, that first Christmas, ironically enough, we're upstairs in our house, and there's a fuss outside, and I look out the window, and I see our neighbors decorating our house because uh, he got diagnosed in November, so there was no time for that thinking. And we were rarely in the house anyway. We were in the hospital. And... Uh, my first reaction was to go out and tell him to stop. You know, it's just my arrogance that had to be defeated. No, no, I'm the, I do stuff for other people. <laughs> and just to, be in control. just to sort of relax into it, you know, and just let it happen. Of course, they put one of those big inflated Santas on the lawn, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was such a wonderful gesture by our neighbors, you know, to see that our house was dark. Right. At that time, and of course the irony is I'm out on the road with Holiday Express, Holiday Express doing stuff. For I have to tell you another ironic thing. Go ahead. I got a little lost coming here today. <laughs> so I went right down, uh, what is this, Getty? Patterson, Getty. Yeah. And I'm in Patterson and I go down and I'm at the corner of Straight and Narrow, which people think <laughs> is a joke. But Straight and Narrow is this amazing place. We go there with Holiday Express every year. And I'm lost getting to you and I'm looking at Straight and Narrow. A lot of people struggle there. What an amazing place, That's though. That's right. I think people don't understand or they don't want to understand. Part of the reason why we do what we do with Holiday Express is to shine a light on some people, you know, and, and straight and narrow. When I went there the first time, God, I thought they were gonna hate us. It's yeah. mostly young people, a lot of returning veterans. That's right. Who maybe had problems going into, that's one of the, I think is one of the untold secrets of our military, is as a, rep as a veteran of the military myself, is the amount of drug abuse that goes on there. Are people that are, it's always been that way. Not necessarily drugs, but it's been for 60, 70, 80 years. If you were a troubled kid, they put you in the army mm. to straighten you out, you know? A lot of these people come out of the service really in terrible shape. I gotta you know? ask you something. Yeah. You talk about giving back. <clears throat> you talk about how hard it is for you to accept, even for your son, right? You've lived an amazing life already and you have so much more to uh -huh. live and give. I know it's a cliche question, but I have to ask you, Tim. We've known each other a long time. 
What message would you want to give to folks watching right now who are struggling either for themselves or with their kid or a loved one who are saying, uh, what the hell difference does it make? Mm. They might want to give up. They might think it's not worth it, you say. <laughs> Boy, you ask difficult questions sometimes. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I do either, you know. I mean, what is it? But you plug at it every day. You know, when Jack got sick, I felt that I was in a unique position not to feel sorry for myself because for the prior, I think we were already about 15 years into Holiday Express, mm. and each year I see between 15,000 to 20,000 people who are beyond heroic. I don't know how they do it. When Jack got ill, we had every reason to believe literally and figuratively that he was going to walk away from that eventually and that he would survive. Whereas I see people who have these horrific cerebral palsy circumstances at birth, as my nephew did. Um, and they know that they're never going to literally or figuratively walk away. It's, it's a, like an atomic bomb going off in these family units. The divorce rates are absurd if you have a critically ill child. And uh, I just don't know how they put one foot in front of the other. I think it is the human spirit. You know, we, this is going to be a crazy connection, and I apologize for this because I haven't really thought it out. But when I hear about suicide bombers, you know, people strapping something on their vest and blowing right. stuff for, for some cause, for some reason. It almost makes you feel like there's millions of them out there, but there aren't. There's very few people who could really do that. I mean, we seem to be having an ap epidemic of suicides in our country right now. A lot of young people, a really great runner who I knew uh, from North Jersey just committed suicide, and it's, yeah, it's heartbreaking, you know. It's best half miler in the state. And, um, <laughs> you know, you wonder about that, but then you realize all these other people, they don't just 99.9% .9 of up. our population doesn't give up. And it's probably the greatest thing you can say about human beings is they don't. And they don't need me to tell them. They don't need you to tell them either how to do it. They've already figured it out. And when Jack got ill, the only thing we were thinking is, what's the next step? What do we do? What's going on here? What's the plan, you know? And I, I kept telling him, listen, I'm a history major, so I'm going to be a no help here whatsoever, <laughs> wow. you know. Interesting. Listen, I'm, you know, it's funny. Maybe the answer to the question is you just keep doing what you're doing. With Holiday Express, um, us talking about uh, the folks that make a wish and just trying to keep uh, one foot in front of the yeah. other. That's all you can do. Tim Because you know, make a wish is interesting because it's just a gesture. It's, it's a gesture. But it's a, it just tells you that people yeah. care. If we've learned anything with Holiday Express, it's if you tell someone else that you care about them, it's a million bucks. Yeah. Hey, listen, Tim McClune is uh, a good friend of this show. He knows he has an open invitation, and you have an open invitation at his restaurants, except the only difference is you have to pay there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Cash is good. Tim McClune is the owner of McClune's restaurants. Let's He's not the, confuse this yeah, issue yeah, that we're yeah, doing yeah, charitable right, work yeah, in the yeah, We're public television. We yeah. have to have sponsors, okay. too. Um, and, uh, and by the way, open up in, in Hoboken. You're we'll be up? there this spring. You are? Yeah, yeah. And that makes how many? Uh, that'll be nine. Yeah, right. You're I doing all right. I don't know all right. You're a good friend. I'm losing Thanks, money at like half of them. So. Yeah, stop. <laughs> we'll be right back right after this. Thanks. You're nuts. I am. <laughs> One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, Caldwell College, the Fidelco Group, Fedway Associates, New Jersey Sharing Network, Kessler Foundation, and by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.